Good afternoon, everybody. Um, if everyone can put their headsets on, because that's how you're going to be able to hear me and the speaker today. Can everyone hear me? No. <laughs> Okay, so I'd like to thank you, thank you all for um, attending this uh, seminar session with PFH Live here at Housing Conference 2024. Um, I'd like to welcome here to talk to you about transformative placemaking and healthy communities, creating healthy communities. We've got Rumpini Perakaki here from um, PRP Architects, who is an associate there um, under the Urban Design and Plan uh, Master Planning um, uh, section of the business. So I would like to hand over to um, Rumpini to talk about Urban Master Planning Placemaking. I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you, Judy. Can you can I check that you can all hear me well? Perfect. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. Sorry, can I? Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you very much for joining here today. Hopefully we're going to have a good conversation around placemaking and particularly uh, how we're considering placemaking and how placemaking rules uh, that can improve the communities and the places that we are designing for people. Uh, thinking about placemaking first, I think personally this is a, um, a person uh, and a quote that uh, inspires me the most. I think Jane Jacobsy has defined the, the importance of placemaking in relation to how we are considering placemaking as a, a people-centric approach and basically uh, how the places they should be created by people and not for people. So I think considering kind of this diagram is the perception about the space and a place. So when we're talking about the space, we're considering all the different elements that they are uh, about the buildings, about the roads, about the uses, about the open spaces, and we're having people that, are, that they are interacting within, within these elements. But the moment we are putting people in the center of our approach, everything comes around them, so everything needs to accommodate for their needs. So here, we're talking about places that are meaningful and places that they are designed for everyone. Since Jane Jacobs, there is um, different tools uh, that they have been produced. Uh, for us to get, a, to get a better understanding about the different placemaking factors and di different placemaking indicators that they are describing the place. And this is a very useful diagram that it has been produced by the Project for Public Spaces. So basically, this describes the four uh, core elements uh, that they are influencing the space. And this has to do about the uses and the activities, what we are offering to the users and the people, about the comfort, what kind of feelings that we are, um, uh, that we are creating to the people and the user of a place, uh, the accessibility and the links, how these places they are interconnected, and sociability is how we are putting communities together and how we are reinforcing them. And around this circle, uh, there are the indicators and also the different variables that actually they give us an indication of the priorities according to each of these categories um, and how each of these they work in relation to the, um, to the build form. But really if we want to, to simplify this diagram and we uh, end up with four different um, and separate categories. Placemaking is all about the homes that we are living in. It's about our streets, our open spaces, and also the environment and our community, how we're interacting with our neighbors, with the people, and how the built environment is really meaningful around our needs and around our different communities. So basically, these are the four anchors uh, in relation to the placemaking. Um, in terms of setting the placemaking strategies, there is kind of a number of tools and a number of questions uh, and a number of things to understand in order to start getting an understanding of what are the key placemaking tools that we need to take into consideration about uh, considering a place. So first of all is understanding the place itself, uh, especially from, uh, from us, the designers, the architects, is really, really understanding the needs of the community and therefore working with the community is really, really important to understand the aspirations and the local needs 
of course, understanding the elements in relation to the, to the culture, to the character, to the heritage that they're going to implement and also create a sense of pride on the communities, how the designs, they are robust, they are design guidelines that they are protecting uh, the final outcome in relation to the public spaces and also really how at the end we are creating a place that it is vibrant, it is meaningful, it is robust and it is resilient. And basically before starting the process about, about identifying the placemaking principles is, and actually this is something that I personally reflect to, is these four questions. Who? Who are we designing for? Who is this places uh, relate to? Why? Why we are designing what we are designing? Why we are taking specific decisions about certain places and what is the process around that? what we're trying to achieve, what these places are going to mean about the communities and where that has to do with the location and all the different and bespoke characteristics that each of the places they have. So basically, placemaking is such a unique term that has to do with the locality, has to do with the bespoke needs of the community, but at the same time it has the more universal principles that they are applying in relation to the considerations of creating the, uh, of creating the different places. Uh, so, taking step by step in terms of where, usually when we're thinking about a place we have a very specific area in mind, usually we're giving about a specific site with specific boundaries, with red boundary lines and we are concentrating our perception and the way we're considering this place about the, the place itself. But what it is important is to look outside these red boundary lines, to understand the place not only um, in its immediate surrounding context, but understand the strategic links, where this place is sitting, what are the other key factors around this place that actually informing the character of this space. So um, on the design perception, it's looking outside these boundaries and trying to understand the strategic and the local level in detail. And also in terms of, of that, we're understanding the demographics of the area, we're, um, we're identifying the local needs, we're identifying the key factors that actually they're influ influencing the connectivity, the character and the way that we're going to approach uh, the design. And actually community itself, uh, this is the most important and key element in relation to the placemaking. Uh, in order to create successful placemaking strategies, it's really important to work with the communities with, to establish what are the key priorities, what are their needs, take the knowledge out of them because it's completely different perception that a designer or an architect, a developer have for a place, considering it for an outsider, and it's a completely different the knowledge that we take from the people that they are actually living in a place or living in, in, in the surrounding areas. It's this level of um, bespoke treatment that is establishing the placemaking principles and how actually these places that we are designing and we are considering, they are becoming meaningful for the people that they are actually going to use them. Uh, of course, each of the place they have their unique characteristics, their heritage elements, their architectural elements uh, that um, they signify the history of the place. So it's more about how we are taking these elements and how we are making sure that these elements are celebrated in our approach. So we are creating a pride of identity um, to, um, to the spaces and the places. And also during this process is how we are activating um, uh, our phases, how we are in between this process, we are also providing meanwhile uses, we are providing different activities that the community as well and can be uh, engaged and they can feel that they are part in this process. So basically we have opportunities of spaces to be activated throughout the process before uh, finalizing any decision making in relation to place making. Uh, and of course, we have the tools on the planning terms that we have and here is where design codes are becoming very, very important, especially with the National Model Design Code that gives the opportunity to establish certain elements in relation to beauty, in relation to functionality of the spaces and making sure that as long as the um, planning 
uh, allows us to protect these elements. This is something that actually future proofs the quality of the spaces and the places that we are designing. So things, these things, they can be captured and they can be established in the design code. So we're making sure that whatever is designed is going to have a long-lasting identity, a long-lasting effect, uh, and it's going to create long-lasting communities uh, overall. Uh, and of course about the activity, establishing the uses, establishing the activity, uh, creating meaningful spaces uh, for, the, for the community, whether it has to do with community venues, uh, more flexible working spaces, seeing about um, any different residential um, developments and at the same time in relation to the housing itself is understanding the types of housing that they are required to um, to reflect the needs uh, of the people, the needs of the specific demographics, and at the same time, I allow the, um, the resilience about them and potentially investigate different types of home typologies that they're going to accommodate for these ever-changing needs. Uh, and I think particularly about the, about the housing elements, um, these are two diagrams in relation to what we call intergenerational master planning, and this comes to, this comes with the, the different groups that we are uh, designing for. Uh, it has to do about mixed communities, that they have different types of home typologies, different types of needs, and instead of creating master plans that everything is going to be zoned differently, we're talking about something that is going to be more integrated and is going to be making more sense about the people. So the sense of belonging and the sense of place making is even stronger. Uh, in terms of the intergenerational and multi-generational master planning, this is an example um, in London. This is the Choban Manor master plan, which is one of the Oly Olympic legacy sites. This is a residential neighborhood that has been created next to the uh, athletes' village. Uh, and this particular master plan, it has been designed taking into the intergenerational master planning as a principle. The specific uh, character of this master plan was the different cultures, the different communities that they were living in the area. It is something that contradicts what has been suggested in the, um, uh, in the athlete's village, which was more higher buildings. This is more of a purely residential neighborhood, interconnected by different types of open spaces, play spaces, and also it has a big variety of different housing typologies. So basically, walking around this neighborhood, it is a journey of um, uh, finding out new places, it's kind of exploring the master plan and exploring different places that this master plan has offered. But in terms of the housing aspect, what has been uh, delivered in this master plan, it's a multi-generational house. This is the first house, multi-generational house that has been delivered in a, in a master plan in London. Uh, basically, this is a product as a housing typology that has derived from the feedback from the, from the community, the needs of the demographics and also that particular master plan it has been delivered during the, um, the economic crisis where the families they started moving back together so we could see the parents with their children with the um, older um, with the elderly within the family having to move back all together so basically this house was offering the main part of the building which could work as a two bed or a three bed uh, house and an annex which could be completely separated from the main building and it could work um, as a one bedroom by itself so potentially um, uh, the grandparents or the younger kids they could move and they can be completely separated so this is something that has derived from the demographics the needs and actually it was a very very popular uh, typology and this actually opened a further investigation and further research of how this can be also be incorporated on a more on potentially flat typologies on duplexes on townhouses so we're getting this resilient character of the multi-generational house further investigated for further um, for further generations these are some pictures of actually the built uh, the built product of that so you can see here the main component divided by a patio and the standalone annex of it and in terms of the intergenerational character and the resilience, I think this is the question, what is the future of our places and what is the future of our communities that comes more and more on the placemaking terms. 
and, uh, and this becomes more and more present, particularly after, after COVID, because COVID was a significant lesson learned on, in our lives. It has re-established the way we live, the way we are using our public spaces, the way you are using our own homes. So there is a lot of things that, ha that they have been redefined on more special terms uh, and in terms of the placemaking. So we have a selection of factors that actually they influence the way we live they influence our needs for this specific time, which they have to do with uh, social, the, the technology, the constant change of the technology and how this has been incorporated within our lives, the environment in itself, the need of a health and well-being. So these are all factors that they can easily change, but at the same time, they define the way that we're experiencing, the way we live and the way that we are perceiving the spaces that we belong. And considering that, um, this is an innovation host innovation toolkit. This is more of a future proofing approach of key considerations about uh, how we can become resilient in the future. And we're talking about new models of living. We can see that uh, the co housing, the co live, the co work, it starts becoming more and more in the agenda in relation to um, uh, what types of typologies we're proposing. Of course, in terms of the construction, is how our con the, con the construction itself becomes uh, more future-proof and more resilient in relation to these um, ever-changing realities. Uh, how we are reimagining the communities, how we are putting the communities again back in the focus of our approach and we are redefining the approach according to that. Uh, and of course affordability, which again, this is linked with housing and the provision of housing and how we are approaching different elements. And I think according to these changing needs, there is a lot of new approaches that they have been established or their approaches that they have been re-established and been rethought. So there is a number of projects that they have been delivered that they're trying to achieve uh, this element. So the idea of the 15 minute city, 20 minute neighborhood, it started becoming more and more popular. And actually this is an idea that started from, from France, from Paris, and it talks about self-contained settlements within the, the built form. So each individual within 15 minute walk or 15 minute drive or 15 minute distance with the public transport, they can cover all their basic needs. So here we're talking about the tool that starts becoming more and more popular. It will allow for our future cities to become less vehicle dependent and at the same time we are creating clusters of different neighborhoods that they have their own identity and their own self-contained um, self character. Of course the idea of the garden cities, again uh, this is a brilliant idea uh, that started back in the 70s and it has been further been developed and established um, uh, nowadays. So again we are talking about, about of how we are creating these meaningful environments that they are connected, they are promoting more sustainability, sustainable uh, modes of transport, new places to celebrate uh, and communities uh, to thrive and how these are interlinked with the, with the surrounding green context. Uh, this is an example, this is the Ashmere Eastern Quarry in Ebsfleet. So this is one of the uh, modern uh, green communities that it's under development now uh, in the UK. And again, it has very successful approach in relation to all the different elements, all the different neighborhoods um, that they are considered within uh, its features. And also, moving, mentioning something that we're going to mention in a while, this is also design taking into consideration the principles about the healthy new towns. So this is something that the garden communities they are interlinked with health and well-being and the measures that we can take in design terms that we can improve and we can allow for this physical and also mental well-being of all the users. And basically this is it. Again we can see that on planning terms and on guide terms there is a, a lot of work that it has been done with the different councils and the NHS about how design is also linked with health, health and well-being. It has to do with the amount of open spaces, it has to do with the different uses that we are providing, it has to do about uh, food growing, the multi-generational element and how this can all be incorporated within our cities and within more urban contexts than um, they were before. 
and some examples, uh, this is a vision uh, on Cambridge, that it was built around the principles of health, um, health in new towns and health and well-being and how this is interlinked uh, with a wider context. Uh, and in terms of the sustainability, again, this is the element in relation to the resilience. So it's apart from the wider scale, apart, apart from the streets, apart from the open spaces, a part of the strategic decision is our homes by themselves, by themselves, how um, they can provide a healthier environment for the users, how the materials that we're using, how the way uh, that they have been oriented, they can create a better environment. Um, to everyone. Uh, this is another example. This is in Barking, Dakin and Grimm, which again there was a specific sustainability approach in relation to each of the home typologies, how they have been constructed, and at the same time how they are interacting uh, with the open spaces. And wrapping up. Placemaking is a very wide term, but at the same time, it, there are the universal principles about how we are approaching placemaking. But what it is important to understand is that each place, each space has its own identity, each community has its own needs. So we have the umbrella terms, the umbrella priorities that they relate to everything, but each place, because it has its unique identity, it needs to be considered differently, it implies the different design solution, different solution in terms of the construction, in terms of the building typologies, in terms of the home typologies, the open spaces that we are providing, we make sure that they reflect the needs of the community. And it's all about the inclusivity, so basically an inclusive healthy space, it provides for everything that has to do with nature, uh, well connectivity, the multi-generational, intergenerational aspect, safety, proud pride of place, uh, and sense of ownership, which actually, this is what placemaking implies to is, as long as the users, the people that they live, all of us, we feel proud about the place that we live and we feel that we belong to that place, we are going to take care of that place. And actually, this is how we're going to create memories, this is how we're going to protect it, this is how we're going to connect to it, and actually this is what is going to make our future cities more resilient and more adapted to, to our needs. And I think that's it for me, thank you. Hi, I just wanted to give out to the floor basically for any questions that you might have. Anybody? No? I think what's really interesting about Athene, what you've said is it's obviously there's some, there are key principles that we've seen throughout the whole master plan, throughout all the policy and design, but you know, do you think there's some changes, ongoing changes to policy that you think will help to support you know, support, support all of our customers to be able to design spaces that are more effective for our communities. And, you know, you talk about multi-generational buildings, the typology that you pulled up was really interesting, I think, because we're all going, we've gone through change, mm -hmm. haven't we, with the pandemic as well, and about how we're changing, we're, we're working from home more, we need other spaces, and people are moving around and trying to reconfigure spaces within mm -hmm. their own homes, but actually providing housing that enables that way that we live that's changing is really interesting as well. So what can planning departments, what can massive planning departments do to support that change? I think it's the, um, on planning terms, I think the National Model Design Code which establishes very good principles because it talks about community participation in the decision making. And I think this is something that once it start become more and more established in planning terms, this is going to make a reassurance about the way we are delivering places and the way that we are interacting. And as well, thinking about more of a regeneration aspect in London, especially when it comes to estates and when it comes to uh, affordable housing, the participation of the community is mandatory, ballots are mandatory in terms of the founding and in terms of the process. So I believe they implementing the interaction with the community and make it mandatory throughout the planning process and at the same time make the commitment from the local authorities and in the planning system that whatever rules that they're established in the 
uh, in the process of the uh, of the place making of the creating a scheme or creating a new development they are becoming mandatory this is what implies that these things they cannot be disregarded this is something that needs to be delivered as the minimum quality so uh, it's kind of a guiding guiding rule so going beyond just that typical consultation going further and beyond that exactly. real engagement within the community uh, exactly. and the cultural diversity of that community exactly. ongoing exactly and I think it's sorry and again it's a personal thing because of the amount of the consultation that I have been personally doing as a architect urban designer master planning myself the knowledge that I have taken while talking to people that they actually live in a place, the way that they are experiencing their priorities, the things that they are concerning to them, it's completely different to the knowledge that I could take kind of doing an analysis on a desktop or kind of reviewing some technical drawings or kind of the understanding that I have myself as a designer. So the moment you talk to people you're unlocking a completely different spectrum of knowledge and as long as we make sure that all the feedback that we receive, first of all be honest because there are certain things that can't be delivered, certain things that they cannot be delivered but as long as we take this knowledge and we make sure that this is incorporated in the decision making later on and we push ourselves as much as we can, I think this is what is going to make the difference. And what about um, assessment and evaluation post occupancy and all that kind of thing, so making sure that you know what has been implemented and delivered is working because yeah. you mentioned before obviously um, the Olympic Park and, and, and those kinds of places that you know we've seen across mm. you know across Europe actually uh, a repurposing of those types of spaces that have been built for one particular purpose and now we're moving into how do we can reconfigure that and it, I guess it's taken that housing typology mm. all the way to the master planning typology and those big um, wider spaces that we're built for one, mm. I guess, similar uh, community to one that is very much more going to be diverse in the future. So how does how do you go around reiteration, improvement, and not thinking that you're done, I guess, mm. I think, in a community? Yeah, no, that's very important. I think the post-occupancy evaluation that you mentioned today is really, really important and actually linked to the example that I mentioned before, the Choban Manor Master Plan. This is currently... Uh, the last fourth phase has been under construction but there is a post-occupancy evaluation that has happened for the first phase and now it's been undergone on the remaining of the phases. So the outcomes of this first phase post-occupancy evaluation it gave so good indicators about the performance of some of the typologies in terms of their energy efficiency but at the same time things about how the place and the master plan works overall so it was a very high satisfactory percentage in relation to the how the master plan works overall but there were some some findings in relation to the construction element of some of the home typologies mm -hmm. the orientation and the materiality that has been used so in the last phases that they have been under development recently making sure that there is completely different approach in relation to how these things they have been built so it's the ongoing it's not when a project is constructed it's not the end of it there's yeah. so much more that we can learn after five years after 10 years after 20 years so this is kind of ongoing engagement that it is required to make the future developments and the yeah. future approach in terms of uh, all the master planning and the, and the new schemes better. And you talked about connectivity, and you talked about mm. beyond the boundary, and I guess that's about beyond the boundary in every sense of the word. So in terms of strategy, in terms of ongoing engagement with communities, making sure that connectivity is there ongoing um, as well, um, I think is really important. But, uh, you know, that multi-generational, multicultural environment. Mm. So again, you know, in terms of the material uses that we've got and the way that we're changing assets now as we move forward in the housing sector, mm. Um, you know what kind of methods are we using as architects and, and, and planners to say you know can a person themselves change that property for example mm. ongoing and is, how simple is that to change you know if you're going to close off for example a unit within your property for a completely independent mm. purpose as opposed to it being part and form of your house at that point in time at a particular point in your time so are other things around detailing and things like that that people are thinking about now in planning and, and architecture to say how can that be done better yeah no definitely and also i think it has to do with the with the flexibility as well because similar to the multi-generational house a flat could easily work of designing it as two units that they are 
interconnected by potentially the living room of this kitchen and then it would be just very easy to just building a wall without having to do significant um, construction or any significant changes on your existing layout you can easily separate that into, into two flats so this is the resilience yeah. really foresight and resilience isn't it and yeah. saying like you know how can you separate your heating system your electrical system yeah. your, 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 you know all of your monitoring of your utilities etc so that if it does need to be separate it can be separate so doing that up front isn't it really rather than trying to do it after the fact in that regard has anybody else got any questions Hi, thanks. Uh, how do you establish market demand for inter intergenerational living? So I think usually in the process there is a particular market testing that it has to do with the demographics, it has to do with the, with, with, with the needs of the market. So particularly for Choban Manor, this derived from the needs of the community and at the same time the specific market testing that have happened on the, uh, on the days of the master plan has been, has been delivered. So basically this is based on data that we receive, the potential kind of the um, uh, the costing, the viability of it, and actually what this targets in relation to the place making. So there are different factors. While we are from the inception of the idea to actually delivering it, it there are different factors that actually they imply how this can become uh, realistically be constructed and can be meaningful. And at the same time, it is um, it is viable to and meaningful for the for the master plan. Any more questions? Okay, thanks very much Thank um, you all. for your time. I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, you will all receive, if you've been scanned, you'll receive a copy of the recording as well um, to your inbox as well to support you. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.